Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Rajat Nag, who's written this book, Asia, the 21st Century? Question mark. Rajat, this has been a long time coming because you've been working on this issue inside the Asian Development Bank and subsequently after your uh, retirement from there. You talk about this being possibly the Asian century, provided certain conditions are fulfilled. Let's start with what you think is a positive element that Asia has lifted a significant part of its population out of poverty. But in this, your poverty estimates seem to be what used to be the old World Bank, one, $1.25. Uh, cents. And it also leaves out the issue that you could have an issue that uh, a lot of the people who are being lifted out of poverty, particularly in countries like India, could fall back into poverty because they're in some kind of precarious condition or in a vulnerability band, as it were. Right. So how do you see this poverty, particularly the structural poverty in countries like India? No, I think that's a very valid point. And what I talk about in the book is, yes, it's great that we have pulled you know, a large number of people out of poverty, but defined a dollar twenty-five and sometimes a dollar ninety. But even that is very low. The bar is very low. So, you know, a simple illness or a natural catastrophe or anything can push people back. And therefore that vulnerability band, as it were, where another about nine hundred million in Asians are, not Indians, but Asians. So the vulnerability band in Asia is large, and in India even more so, because China has done much better than India has. So my concern is really that though we've got much to celebrate, even in India, in terms of pulling people out of poverty, the vulnerability band is quite huge. And therefore, I think there are some major concerns about India's fight against poverty, or India's victory against poverty, or for that matter, Asia's. And this is why in that book, as you just showed, I put a question mark because though, of course, one hopes that I'm wrong, but I think the fight against poverty is far from over. And then, of course, you superimpose on those serious concerns about social deprivations, about rising inequality, rising, not just high, but rising inequality. And you have a picture which is mixed, and that is the whole thrust of this book. Uh, will that question mark be answered in the positive or not? I think that's an interesting question mark, of course, that what are the causes of possible, shall we say, not being able to grow, grow right. out of poverty? Right. Right. And what are the possibilities of getting or getting stuck in a poverty trap? Right. And of course, the issue of is also that the line of poverty mm. is a socially moving one. Right. It's not something right. which should be right. considered absolute, right. though it did. We do tend to take $1.25 or now $1.90 as the absolute poverty mm -hmm. measurement, mm -hmm. not a, dis mm -hmm. a social poverty in right. terms of distance, inequality, and so on. But even in terms of that, the argument is that countries like India, while it has done something which is significant in terms of moving it out of what would be considered absolute uh, starvation level, as it mm -hmm. were, which is really $1.25. Right. But the uh, middle class in India is also very narrow. Right. That means that the people who have grown out of poverty are still very much, largely, in what would be considered or should be considered as poor. And they could easily slip back. I mean, that's the, that's the whole point. Uh, you know, you're absolutely right. So the poverty story in Asia, in one sense, is a very positive one because Asia has achieved in one generation what took other parts of the world in a couple of hundred years. But the victory is far from in the bag, as it were. It's a precarious one. It is a precarious one. And therefore, what I do point there is the need for inclusive growth, the green growth and clean growth, but inclusive growth, which is that you provide people the means to not only benefit from growth, but also participate in the growth. Therefore, investments in health and education, for example, become very important. We'll come to that, but you also have talked about, and I think that's a very interesting point in the book, the issue of the middle income trap. Right. Right. Now, of course, that is as a country you are in middle income. It's not right. really about the structure of the poverty or the income, as it were. It's really mm -hmm. the averaged income right. you know, of calling it middle income trap. Now, you have said that the middle income trap 
exists if you do not invest in education and technology and so on so that you do not you're not able to participate in what society is moving towards mm -hmm. that means particularly when you talk about technology it's not doing what already exists but doing what new things are coming into right. being being right. able to participate in that and you've contrasted brazil and south korea in that because right. south korea did participate in the tech revolution if right. you will right. while brazil got stuck into right. a commodity right. production service economy which is what really is today so how do you, what do you think are the elements which create the possibility of escaping the escaping the middle income trap two things one is higher productivity so with the same inputs you produce more and and uh, both labor productivity and capital productivity so that's one but i think the more important one to escape the middle income trap is innovative capacity so that you know you not only produce the ipads or assemble the ipads but you actually design them and that is where the sort of you know uh, money is that is where the value added is so for asia and i'm talking about asia but this applies very much to india as a matter of fact more to india than china or or korea that our education system has to be such that not only do you improve the basic literacy the basic numeracy but also at the higher end of the spectrum so investments in the primary education basic education is very important but so is investments at the higher end because unless a country can innovate it will not be able to participate in this so called growth ladder and we will not be able to compete with countries above us on that because we are not as innovative or productive and we will not be able to compete with countries below us because our wages have gone up so then that's how you get caught in a middle income trap so i think the ability to be more productive and the ability to be more innovative are two critical elements for a country like india when you talk about being more productive you're really talking at the end of technology okay that's that's or, or through the process yeah. or at, at any level being more productive with a given amount of capital given amount of labor would obviously help but that's not going to be enough it might have been enough previously but now innovation as i said i think is going to have to be so key. Technology, technology development is going to be the right. key for the future right. and let's let's be very honest about it what differentiates a developed country from a not so developed one is a level of the human capacities exactly. Exactly. therefore exactly. it is what what we build into the people right. is what finally reflects its development right. Right. now coming back to that issue what you talk about it would then mean investing in people mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. this is the problem that we have now that mm -hmm. for instance in a country like india there is a lot of investment in so the iits the indian institute of science and they do take a disproportionate amount of resource out of the education system in order to create the so called centers of excellence which then compete at the global level but the problem with that is that if you see today these are the sectors which indian state is not investing any further we are talking about building new iits new aims but the kind of infrastructure we are building is abysmal in mm -hmm. those places mm -hmm. and even if you would take an iit for iit for instance and i have had very senior scientific members uh, community people coming and telling me that india was at the cutting edge once upon a time mm -hmm. even if the institutions were few today we really right. have third rate infrastructure over the including right. the iits now how do you see your move out of uh, the middle income trap and what india seems to be do, doing i'm focusing more right. on india because korea and china have invested quite heavily in scientific and technical infrastructure in terms of right. education and institutions how do you see this happening this right. seems to be actually extremely retrogressive in terms of policies yeah i think we've got to think both in terms of the spending on education as part of the overall macro and then within education higher education basic education iits first of all i think india just has to invest much more on education per se. period per se uh, we invest you know less than 2% of gdp we should be spending more like 5% yeah. and and health and education together we spend less than 4% it should be closer to 10 now the 12 5 year plan does talk about increasing it significantly uh, and it is increasing yes but not enough but there is no so, plan at the moment as you know well 
I mean, you know, uh, there is no official plan, but the, the, the notional edu expenditure in education health is increasing. Good news. Bad news is nowhere enough. The other part is what you're saying, the intrasectoral uh, distribution. There, I think it would be a mistake if we think that we will invest more in primary education at the cost of investing in higher education. I think we just have to increase the pie for education. Because unless we invest more in higher education, including in the IITs, and of course the number of IITs and all that is another major issue, uh, we will not be able to compete on the global scale at all. And what's happening now, I'm afraid, is we are playing a numbers game. We're playing a numbers game in terms of number of engineering colleges or number of IITs or AIMSs, and quality is what's going to matter. Uh, and I think, and you're right, that we are, I think, losing that sort of, you know, edge that we had. We still have IIT graduates who do very well elsewhere, but the question is, can they do better inside the country? And the answer is no, for a variety of combinations. But one is public expenditures on education needs to, education and health, I should add, needs to increase very significantly. You see, we had significant investments in building up science and technical institutions. And if we look at the issue of escaping the middle income crap, coming back to that, you really have to then invest in those institutions as well, as you said. Right. And our science R&D expenditure is also extremely poor. And that's why we had science marches in the country of scientific community saying what's happening. Right. Because even in CSI, R&D expenditure is now being cut severely. Mm -hmm. And without research and development, you're right. not going to get anywhere. Right. Right. The implication of this is the belief that private sector will come in and fill the gap. The point is, even in the United States, a right. lot of this is public infrastructure right. Right. in public investment. Right. And that's the, right. that Absolutely. is the long-term. Uh, education and health uh, has to be a public good up to a point. And that's not mean, you know, 100%, but certainly not sort of where we are. And yes, the private sector will have a role to play, uh, but I think it will be a big uh, error of policy judgment uh, if we sort of say, we'll free up this space and just let the private sector come in. Uh, I think we should not make artificial impediments for the private sector, but there's no getting away from the fact that you, know, you need significant public sector investments in social infrastructure. As somebody once said, how many Einsteins do not get to study physics? physics. And how many of them are there right. in India right. will not get to study right. physics? Right. If we and depend we on only We can't get away from that, that. Uh, for education and health. Segwaying to the second point that you have in your book, the question of inclusive growth. Right. And this, of course, what mm -hmm. we've discussed, touches upon the issue of inclusive mm -hmm. growth. And mm -hmm. you've talked about that there is bad inequality and good inequality, right. irrespective of whether I agree with you about good inequality or not. Mm -hmm. But the bad inequality, I would completely agree with right. you that if right. there is no equality of opportunity, right. access, right. that means access not just simple being able to attend a school, but getting quality education in the school, affirmative action if it's a first generation learner because right. he or she might require more support, right. provi providing health and other facilities for zero to five years. You've talked about malnutrition means they're already compromised for out life. of the uh, out of their lifetime uh, security, in fact, because that zero to five years is crucial for growth right. of the brain as well. Right. Now, all of that, are we not sort of going, at least uh, if we see the policy pronouncements being made of the government, uh, we are going in, in a retrogressive direction? You know, uh, one way or another, uh, I'm not so concerned, frankly, Prabhupada, on the policy pronouncements, is the implementation. Now, policies, aren't bad, I mean, even in India. Uh, but I think it's the implementation that we are, we are talking about. So for example, we talk about, let's say the bad inequality. We'll talk about the good inequality if we have time. But not being able to invest enough in education basically means you are exacerbating the access to opportunities to the primary school, which results in more inequality. And therefore, I think it's not our policies, but the implementation. We have a right to education. Great, I mean, but so what? I mean, you know, if you don't have the schools, if you don't have the facilities, 
And as a matter of fact, sometimes, and you're right, sometimes these can be uh, regressive because this automatic pass through, for example, uh, visiting many schools in the last uh, couple of months actually, actually has worsened the situation because the emphasis has now become on quantity and just basically pass through. So students will automatically go up to grade eight without the necessary skills to even go to grade, grade five or six. So I think in India, well, in Asia in general, India in particular, it's the implementation of these policies which I think are important. Well, let me distinguish between policy pronouncements and policies. One is what you do in terms of public relations, mm -hmm. make good noises. Mm -hmm. Implementation is what physically happens on right. the ground. Ground, right. you know. Right. I do believe there are also policies, but right. that's a nomenclature issue right. we can debate. Right. What we are seeing is really cutbacks mm -hmm. and cutbacks in terms of teachers, in terms of right. investment right. being made, right. without even talking about need to upgrade them. Right. And that's that's where right. I'm saying the gap is actually widening right. in terms right. of the pronouncements and actual implementation. Right. Exactly. I, I have no problem with that. So there's no policy which says we'll reduce investments, but that's right. exactly what we're doing, and that's a problem. 